completely wrong for the United Kingdom or indeed any other country to say Ukraine should give up part of that, their territory. That would be very wrong. And what I worry is the lesson it would give to aggressors around the world if Russia was seen by sabre-rattling, by landing up, lining up troops on the border, lining up tanks on the border, then successfully gaining a piece of Ukrainian territory. Sure. What message would that send to others around the world? It would be a terrible message and the long-term threat to global Let's security like would be quickly. appalling. David? No, I just wondered if you, you didn't mention anything uh, about attempting to negotiate or broker some peace deal. Well, the, uh, we have been involved in working on negotiations with our American, French and German colleagues, and we are providing support to the Ukrainians to do just that. But it is ultimately about what the Ukrainians are willing to negotiate. What I don't want to see is Ukraine be put under any pressure to give up territory for expediency's okay. sake, because I'm saying it simply won't be expedient, because all we'll see is Russia retreat and then come back for more later. And they still haven't given up their ambitions to take the whole of Ukraine. It was a tactical retreat away from Kiev, yeah. not a long-term retreat, and we need to be very, very worried about Putin's intentions. Mm. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that I favour raising our defence spending to 3% okay. of GDP over the next Still decade. Still got lots of questions to get through. Sorry. So, if I may, no, not at all. I want to bring in our next uh, question, which is about housing, and it's from Jude from Chippenham. And I've wanted to say this all evening. Hey, Jude. <laughs> uh. Hey, Kate, thank you very much. Um, hello, Foreign Secretary. I have recently graduated and will be moving to London to start a new job as a commercial lawyer. When I made the decision, I thought, perhaps naively, that it would make sense to buy somewhere in London rather than rent. But that was before I saw the cost of a deposit on a starter home. How will you solve the housing crisis and make it easier for young people to own their own home? Jude, I think it's incredibly important that we help more people get on the housing ladder. It is a problem that this generation of young people end up buying houses much later in their lives than previous generations. But the way to do it is not the system we have at the moment, which is Soviet-style top-down housing targets, which simply uh, cause huge concern and don't actually deliver the results we want. And I've, before I became an MP, I was a councillor, I sat on a planning committee. It was hours of my life I'll never get back <laughs> because, because we didn't have any control over what happened. Everything got overruled by the planning inspectorate in Bristol. So what I want is a much more localised system of planning. So in London, for example, I think there's more opportunity to build up uh, in London, uh, to build more you know, higher storey buildings. I think in other parts of the country, what we need is more investment zones where we have industry developed alongside homes, alongside infrastructure, and that can be determined by local people. But the one-size-fits-all planning system we have at the moment simply doesn't work. The other thing I do to help you specifically is when somebody does rent, they should be able to use their rental history towards getting a mortgage for their home. And that will help people who are long-term renters get onto the housing ladder. OK, just want to share this quote with you um, that you... Uh, I think it was uh, three years ago, perhaps a little bit longer. We need to build a million homes on the London Green Belt, near railway stations and around other growing cities, specifically to allow the under-40s to be able to own their own homes. Do you still want to build a million homes on Green Belt and the like? So what I don't want to do, Kay, is build it on the Green Belt. Because Changed I do mind. think... Well, I've changed, I've changed my view on that. I'm still very keen for the under 40s to be able to own their own homes. But what I've seen is that the way these top down targets have resulted in having the opposite effect of getting the homes built. And I'm now of the view that what we need to do is have okay. incentives to get local councils to set up investment zones and do things differently because the current system isn't working. OK, so you've changed your mind on that one. Uh, Jill from Tunbridge Wells. Are you angry, Jill? <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> well, disgusted. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Liz. Um, Hi. How important is it to balance the books? So the answer is, it is important over the long term to make sure 
that the private sector is growing faster than the public sector and we were able to generate the revenues for our economy and also be able to pay for our public services. But it isn't right to try and balance the book straight away when we've had a major global crisis like COVID and every single country in the world has built up debts from that crisis. And in fact, we have lower levels of debt than most of the G7 countries. So I think trying to balance the books prematurely is actually counterproductive because if you put up taxes and you stop businesses forming, you stop new investment and you stop economic growth, you're less likely to be able to pay down the debt over the longer term. Happy with that? No. Doesn't look as though you no, are. Not so not what's your follow-up question um, on that one? Liz, I do not want to see my children and my grandchildren encumbered with huge debt at a time of rising interest rates, Bank of England today, and at a time of high inflation. The one thing Margaret Thatcher believed in was sound money. This is not sound economics. And the whole business about economic growth, tax cuts do not necessarily produce economic growth. If you look at Germany, for example, it has much higher corporation tax than we have. And indeed, even with the rises, they're in the pipeline. And yet their economy is not tanking in the way that ours is tanking. So I think this, is, this question of balancing the books is really fundamental. Sound bites or sound economics? Well, we, we have lower levels of debt than countries like the US, Canada and Japan. So it's simply not true to say that we have particularly high national debt at the moment. But what I do know is that families across the country are struggling to pay their bills. And what I would do is help relieve... 15% interest rates, Liz. I remember those days. I had to pay a mortgage of 15%. Are we going back to that level again? No, because we've got an independent Bank of England that make decisions about interest rates. And we're, we're, we're nowhere near uh, that, that position at all. But to say that we're going to put up taxes to the highest level and beyond the highest level in 70 years, and we think there'll be no consequences for economic growth, I'm afraid I think that's wrong. And I speak to lots of companies, lots of businesses who are very concerned about the proposals to raise corporation tax. They're very concerned about the level of interest rates. They're very concerned about the regulations on their businesses at the moment. The fact is that Britain has got less competitive relative to other countries. Under these corporation tax proposals, we would have corporation tax that is 10 points higher than Ireland. Yeah. And it will make us less competitive. In Germany? And you don't get... Germany? Well, Germany has a very, very different economic system from the UK. OK. Let, uh, we've got one time for one more question. Tom from Gateshead. Where's Tom? We'll come yes, back yes. to other questions. Tom, hi. Sorry. Hi. Thanks very much. Liz, why did you announce a well-researched and fully costed policy in which you openly said you valued the work of teachers, nurses and police officers in Newcastle, where I work, less than you value those in Guildford, for example? We're having this election because of poor judgment and trust. Why should we trust your judgment? Well, the reason that I immediately decided not to pursue that policy is it was being misinterpreted, in fact, in exactly the way you said, because it wasn't about teachers or nurses or doctors. And immediately, as there were concerns expressed about this policy, I said, we're not going ahead with it. And I do think, in politics, there are times when you have to make judgments about what is right and you have to be honest with the public. And I was very honest about the situation. It wasn't a core part of my policy plank, but I'd rather be upfront and, if there's a problem, make a decision and deal it with it straight away. And I think you can see, in my time as Foreign Secretary, in my time as Trade Secretary, I've been completely upfront about everything I've done. I've explained why I've done it. I've explained when there is a change, why there is a change. And that's the approach I would take as Prime Minister. So uh, the press release didn't say that. It said that it would be, um, it, it, in order to reach the 8.8 .8 billion in savings, that it would be expanded out beyond civil service, uh, be, beyond the civil service itself. Um, so that's a mistake. Will you apologise? Because it was actually quite offensive. Well, I have been very clear that I will not go ahead with this policy and that I have made a decision to do that straight away. And I've been upfront about that. Okay. I don't think there is anything 
to be ashamed of, of saying publicly that this is not working as I wanted it to work and therefore I have changed the position on it and I'm not going ahead with it. OK, this gentleman had a view on that. Just wait for your microphone, sir. Can we just get a microphone down here? Thank you. You were shaking your head, sir. I did, yeah. I'm, I hate this um, apologise, you know, for everything that you might have said. I just don't really don't understand it. The, the opposition are always asking uh, other politicians to apologise for what they may or may not have done. Uh, and it really doesn't sit well with me. When somebody's asking for your vote, you don't expect to be offended. Well, simple as that. What's that supposed to mean? But, you know, well, you, well, you I won't I won't, I won't, I won't intrude, I won't intrude on this. My point but, you know, was, if, you shouldn't have done it. We, we are going into very, very difficult times as a country. Yeah. And we've just talked about that. And we need somebody leading this country who is prepared to make decisions, who is prepared to deal with issues as they arise okay. and is prepared to be up front with the public. Okay. And I think uh, I've demonstrated that in everything I've done, in all of the jobs I've held okay. uh, during this campaign. OK, I'll come back to you, madam, if I may. If you take a seat, please, Miss Truss, it's time for my go. Everybody <laughs> ready? Here we are. Glass of water. I wanted to pick up, actually, uh, just where we'd left off there on, on what the gentleman was asking you um, about on this press release. We do want... We just want to bottom it out so we know exactly where we are. Um, you said that public sector pay policy has been misrepresented by the media. Here's the proposal that you released. Introduce regional pay boards tailoring pay to the cost of living where civil servants actually work, saving up to £8.8 .8 billion pounds per year. So how have we misrepresented you so far? Well, what... what... I am clear about is that policy was not about teachers and doctors. But can I be clear, Kay, that I am not going ahead with this you policy? You can, but you said that you were because, misrepresented. I'm just clarifying. Because because of the concerns that have been expressed. Okay, you and when something is just wrong, to clarify. when there's an issue, okay. I deal with it. Okay, but just to clarify whether you were misrepresented or not, you highlighted a very specific saving, eight point eight billion pounds. How did you reach that figure? Well, I don't have the details, and I do think well, discussing a policy you, that I'm not progressing with... Well, I can tell with... you, would, would, obviously, these people, it's, it's very pressing for these people, or certainly some of them, so we just want to bottom it out, and then we're definitely there, and I'm sure you won't have to answer these questions again. It's exactly the same figure, the £8.8 8 that was issued by the Taxpayers' uh, Alliance. They say regional-based pay could allow private sector salaries to catch up with the public sector. This can be done by freezing or reducing pay for existing roles and new positions. In other words, pay cut for nurses, doctors, firemen, police officers in less affluent areas, which is what this gentleman was saying. That wasn't what you were proposing. You've changed Absolutely, your mind. Absolutely, that was not my intention. But given the concern that was caused, I took an immediate decision not to proceed with this policy. OK. Ben and Houchin. I am somebody who immediately... If there are issues of concern and those are not delivering what I want to deliver, I will make a decision to do the I right hear, thing, I and that's you. what I've done. Not just this gentleman here, but Ben Houchin, the Conservative Mayor of Tees Valley, said there's no way you can do this without a massive pay cut for five and a half million people, including nurses, police officers and our armed forces outside of London. Do you accept that you made a mistake by announcing the policy? I do accept that the way the policy has been interpreted to cover those people was not right, and that's why I took an immediate decision not to go ahead with it. You offended people, though. You misread the mood. You accept that it was a mistake. What I've said is I absolutely accept that it wasn't the right policy to deal with this situation, and therefore I withdrew the policy immediately. Uh and I'm somebody who is honest and upfront, Kay, I dealt with the issue immediately after the concerns were expressed about the, how this policy had been interpreted and I've dealt with it straight away. OK, it was a mistake, though. Well, as I've said, I've withdrawn the policy. We're not going ahead with the policy. So, therefore, you know, the, the points you're making are about a policy that isn't happening. No, no, what I'm saying is should good leaders own their mistakes um, or should they blame others? I'm not blaming you blame anybody the else. I'm not... I'm, you do. not you I, I'm saying that um, the policy has been misrepresented by various people 
But what I don't want at this time when people are struggling with the cost of living is to concern people with this policy, which isn't a core part of my policy platform, and I'm not going ahead with it. OK, let's talk about the economy, seeing as we've moved on to that. Um, I want to talk to you about your plans to help the worst off, if I may. We've spoken to Selena. She's a single mum in the northeast of England. She works part-time to support her three children and earns just over £10,000 a year. What will you do to help her when her energy bills reach £500 a month in January? So, first of all, I'll take immediate action to reverse the national insurance rise. And won't also, help her. won't help her. She earns less than twelve thousand five hundred and seventy pounds, so she she won't well, benefit. Well, also the green energy levy will be taken. That's one hundred and fifty pounds, and her bit, and so that's a drop in the bucket, really, isn't it? And what Apparently, I will something also like do something like nine days of energy for her. And what I will also do is work to increase the amount of supplies we're getting out of the North Sea, so that we can get more gas into our system, so we can move forward on dealing with the energy crisis and energy security, Not because by January, ultimately. Though. Ultimately, these problems can only be dealt with by, first of all, making sure Putin is defeated by the Ukrainians so that okay. we don't have this energy supply problem, and also by releasing more reserves in the North Sea. I'm also in favour of fracking in areas that support it so we get more of our own domestic energy supply. But what I can assure you, Kay, is I will do all I can to help people who are struggling with the cost of living. I understand that people are going through difficult times and if there are any more available resources, of course, I would put that to helping people with the cost of living. Let me tell so you what Selena says, the, if I the, may. These are Selena's words. I'm really worried about how I'm going to keep my children warm and fed. This is going to cost lives if they don't do something now. But this is why it's so very important that we offer support to businesses, that we... It's not keep... going to help her. Well, it, it will help her How? because the real danger we're in as a country, and this is what the Bank of England has said today, is we're facing a recession. And what a recession would mean is people losing their jobs, businesses going out of business, people struggling across the country. So that's why it's so important we do things like keeping corporation tax low, keeping personal taxes as low as possible, getting, getting things like infrastructure structure projects done quicker to grow the economy. That is ultimately the way we are going to deal with this crisis, is through economic growth. OK. Here's an idea. What about the windfall tax? Shell posted profits of £9.3 billion between April and June. If we put that another way, Shell made £1,190 per second. So since I started this sentence, they've made £17,000 in profit. Why don't we have another windfall tax? Well, the problem with a windfall tax is that it might secure money in the short term. But what it does is it puts off companies investing in Britain in the long term. Because he, they, he think, they, wouldn't, they think they? at any point they could be taxed. And I think that is a problem. What we need to show is Britain's open for business. We're a country that keeps to our word of what our taxes are. And windfall taxes are essentially surprise taxes that companies don't know that are happening. What I would do instead, Kay, is make sure we're incentivising the likes of Shell to be releasing more resources from the North Sea to actually help the problem that we face, which is a lack of energy supply. The head of BP said that he would continue to... his business would continue to invest if there was another windfall tax. It's not just BP, though. It's the signal that it sends to every business across the country that the government is willing to give you a surprise tax. And I think that is a problem for Britain. I've already talked about how our corporation tax rate is uncompetitive compared to other countries. If we also have a reputation for levying a surprise tax on any industry that makes a profit, that is a big problem for our country. Shell is giving their um, shareholders £6.5 billion. Pounds. People at home watching will, who can't afford to um, heat their homes uh, come the winter will be horrified at that. But it, Look at who these shareholders are. These shareholders are often people with pensions, you know, pension funds. You know, the, the shareholders are not, you know, all sort of men in suits sitting, sitting in offices. You know, there is a real... There's no such thing as free money. And I just think we've got to be very careful if the UK gets a reputation for arbitrarily taking money in tax that we've not sort of done through the official tax system, 
I think that's a problem. OK, let's move on to foreign affairs. We've talked about it a little bit. Do you want a sip of water? Yeah. You're very welcome. Um, talking about Taiwan, I'm sure that we've all seen, haven't we, what's been happening uh, in Taiwan over the last few days. Um, as Foreign Secretary, you told a select committee last month that we should have armed Ukraine earlier. Should we arm Taiwan now? Well, what we do need to make sure is that democracies like Taiwan are defended. And yesterday I put out a statement with my fellow G7 foreign ministers about the very difficult situation in Taiwan and concern about the rhetoric that we're hearing from China, the escalatory rhetoric. Of course, we have a very, uh, a very secure control system for exports in the United Kingdom, and we do licence exports to Taiwan at, at the moment, exports that are provided by the private sector. So should we arm them or not? Well, what I'm saying is we already licence equipment to go to Taiwan. OK. And it's a long-standing policy of the UK government to do that. OK, you said we, uh, to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee in June, the uh, month before last, we should have done things earlier, we should have been supplying the defensive weapons into Ukraine earlier. We need to learn that, that lesson for Taiwan. Every piece of equipment we have sent takes months of a training, so the sooner we do that, the better. So just to clarify, we do licence um, arms that go there, but... That is, that is as far as we're going to go at this stage? Yes, that is as far as we will go at this stage. But we are working with our allies very closely on this because there are countries like the United States, Japan, okay. who also are extremely concerned about the future of Taiwan. Okay. And what we need to do is work collectively. And I have championed the G7 acting together as an economic NATO to challenge some of China's economic coercion practices, but also to make sure we're looking at the security situation and making sure democracies like Taiwan are protected. I'm sure you can understand, Kay, that I can't go into every detail of those Not conversations because I want on just, TV, sure. but it's a, it's a very important principle that we do not allow aggressors to, uh, to invade you know, democratic... Okay. democratic places. We've seen Nancy Pelosi, another strong, influential woman in Taiwan this week. Uh, will you visit Taiwan if you're Prime Minister? Uh, we, we currently have a long-standing... So yes or no question, long, really? No. Uh, we, 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 we have a long-standing position okay, that the Foreign fine. Secretary, the Ministry of Defence and the Prime Minister okay. don't visit Taiwan. Let me talk to you about uh, Ukraine. Was it an error of judgment to say you'd support Brits going to fight in Ukraine? What I was very clear about is that I supported the cause of the fight in Ukraine, but I've always been clear that the travel advice is that British people should not go to Ukraine. No, what you said was, I do support that when Zelensky called for international volunteers. Ukrainians are fighting for freedom, not just for Ukraine, but the whole of Europe. And you did support people, you did support Brits going to Ukraine to fight. Well, what I supported... You had to be corrected what by I was, your own defence secretary. What, what I was saying is that I supported the cause in Ukraine. OK. Your Foreign Office website said Brits travelling to fight in Ukraine could be committing an act of terrorism. Did you know that when you said it? Well, what, what I've said is that I support the cause in Ukraine and actually I've done a lot of work to support British citizens who have been detained in Ukraine, who've been there in the long term and the Foreign Office has provided those people Are you support. sorry that people misinterpreted what you were saying? Well, what I have said is that the, defend the advice was very clear, the travel advice was very clear, and I announced that publicly, that people shouldn't go to Ukraine. But I think what is happening... It wasn't happening, very clear, because we spoke to people happening... in Poland who were going into Ukraine, who were Brits that had crossed the border and were then subsequently going into Ukraine. Well, many... You know, the, there have been many British people going into Ukraine okay. during the war, but we are very clear about our travel advice. OK, I've got some quick-fire questions for you, if I may. Here we go. In your first meeting with the Queen, will you apologise for wanting to abolish the monarchy? Well, I've already... <laughs> <laughs> I've already met the Queen and she's been far too polite to raise that issue with me and I will not be, uh, I will not be raising it with her. OK. But if she did, would you apologise? Well, I was wrong. Uh, I was wrong to say what I did at the time. OK. Will you be apologising to the First Minister of Scotland when you see her? No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's the naughtiest thing you've ever done? I'm certainly, I'm certainly not <laughs> going to say that on TV. Oh, was it that naughty? <laughs> well, my daughters are watching, so I don't want them, <laughs> I don't want them getting any ideas, Kay. Yeah. Uh, being Prime Minister, 
is the most invasive, um, exposed period in any politician's life. Is there anything that you feel that you would want to come clean with the audience here in the studio and at home? Because there's with... no one else listening, so it's all <laughs> fine. I can just tell. Anything that you need to get off your chest? There are, I can tell you, Kay, there are no skeletons in my closet. I think everything I've ever said and done is known about very publicly. <laughs> uh, would you remove the whip from Boris Johnson if he's found to have deliberately misled Parliament over Partygate? Um, I'm not making any prejudgments about that. Why not? Well, I'm just... I'm not making prejudgments. I'll see what the committee says. But if they say deliberately misled Parliament? As I say, I'm, I mean, not, is... I'm, I'm, I'm not making any prejudgments about okay. that. OK, what one changed... I, by the way, I'm very clear he didn't mislead Parliament. Well, we'll see what the uh, business... Uh, what the committee says. What one change to the system would you make to restore integrity? Because there's a lot of people here in the studio... Thank you. Uh, uh, not just here in the studio, but watching at home as well. You know, integrity has been lost in the Westminster bubble. What would you do to change it? Well, I think the, the answer to restoring integrity isn't introducing more rules, because we have endless rules and codes. The issue is about clarity and leadership and doing what you say you will do and following through on your promises. What I would also do as Prime Minister is restore the chief whip to number 12 Downing Street. The chief whip was moved out by Alistair Campbell and replaced with the press office. I think that was a mistake because it reduced the link between the prime minister, the chief whip and the parliamentary party. And I would make sure... I, I would make sure we had zero tolerance for bad behaviour in the parliamentary party, but we're also supporting MPs. Because, as you say, you know, being prime minister is an exposed job, but actually being an MP at the moment is pretty difficult. You know, there's all kinds of difficult things said about you on social media. You know, it can be very difficult for people's family lives. So, at the same time as making sure we have discipline and, you know, making sure people are honest and behave themselves, we also do need to offer MPs that welfare and, and support as well. And a new ethics well. advisor. Just... And you... Stand by, if you would. A new <laughs> ethics advisor. Well, I will... I will look at the role of the uh, ethics advisor, but... I'm somebody who does act with integrity and I think people have seen that in every job I've done. And I slightly worry about outsourcing ethics to somebody else. Uh, so no as Prime Minister, advisor. I should You've know the ethics. difference between right and wrong. And, of course, there need to be proper independent complaints procedure, there needs to be proper whistleblowing procedures, but I would want to look at how how those things are structured. OK, you were loyal to the PM despite parties during lockdown or when he promoted a man who groped colleagues or when he was rewriting the rules to help out his mates. Um, throughout that, you stood um, shoulder to shoulder with a man who has betrayed the office of Prime Minister. I don't agree with that characterisation, Kay. I supported, I supported Boris Johnson for the leadership. I think he did a good job as our Prime Minister. He delivered Brexit. He delivered the vaccines. He also uh, did a fantastic job of leading the free world in standing up to Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. Yes, he made mistakes. That's absolutely true. You know, he, he said sorry uh, for the mistakes he made. But I think it's completely wrong to characterise him in that way. I don't know. What does the audience think? Here, here. Yeah, agreed, agreed, no, agreed. No, no, no. no. <laughs> OK. So, I think it's opinion. Opinion is divided on that issue. I think we can hear, we can hear from, from people in the audience. But I have worked closely with Boris Johnson. I know the difficult times he went to. You know, he was in very serious trouble uh, when he had COVID. And, you know, it, it's been a very, very difficult time to be in government. But, look... You know, many mistakes were made during lockdown, Kay, um, you know, by, by many people. And I just think to sort of say that this was the, you know, crowning problem is, is not right. Yeah, some in charge of policy, some not. A final question for you just before we let you go. You were a Remainer and now you're not. You supported uh, Brits to fight in Ukraine, then you didn't. You wanted to build on the Green Belt and now you don't. You wanted to abolish the monarchy, and now you don't. 
You wanted to arm Taiwan, and now I'm not sure if you're saying whether you do or not. You wanted civil I'm servants. We, we do provide them okay. with those. You facilities. wanted to cut civil servants' pay in the regions, and then you said you didn't. Will the real Liz Truss please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm somebody who, you know, I didn't come from a traditional conservative background. My first political experience was going on a CND march with my mother, age seven. You know, I then, uh, as a teenager, joined the Liberal Democrats. I'm not sure how much I should be held to account for things I said when I was 18 or 19. But I've always had a belief that we can be a more successful country, that people should be able to control their own lives. I've always believed in the principle of freedom. I've always believed in low taxation, and yes, my views on other issues have developed over time. But show me somebody who has the same views at 19 and 49, and I'll show you somebody who's not capable of original thought. So, yes, you know, I have. I have, you know, developed my views. I've considered okay. things differently. And I also listen to people. OK. And I, and I think that's important. Okay. So, what we've been talking we're about running, today we're out of time. We have to on give, the policy um, is I've to listened Rishi to the people. same amount of time. I did say, will the real list trust please stand up? You're still sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> That's just because you're trying to get rid of me, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> please thank you, thank, you thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't give us one second. Thank you. Let's get some reaction from the audience, should we? Gentleman over here, I heard um, who was uh, shouting out. Gentleman yes. here. Yep. Boom. There, sir. Go on. I was going to say, um, Liz mentioned about nothing in her closet. She mentioned about integrity. Does that mean at some point in the future, if she's proved to have lied about something, she's going to resign? I don't know. What do you think? That's what I wanted to ask her. <laughs> 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 Who else has got a question? The lady here had her hand up earlier. Yes, madam? Um, I was just wanting to ask if she actually believed that Boris Johnson's actions had damaged the Conservative Party and their chances in the next general election. OK. It's Great question. Have you, you obviously all, mostly are, in fact, all of you are going to be people that will be voting for our next Prime Minister. Have you received your ballot papers yet? No. No, no you no. still haven't received them. You have one person, but most people haven't. OK. Well, obviously, we're moving on to the next section now of our programme. You'll be able to hear what Mr Sunak thinks, and then we're going to ask you what you think. How does that sound? Ladies and gentlemen, Rishi Sunak. Hi, Kev. Yeah, Brilliant. <laughs> so we're going to do exactly the same as we did with Lift Tross. Is that OK? We're going to Sounds start great. with the questions from the audience and then I've got some questions for you as well, oh, okay. if that's OK. All right. Here we go. Let's, go. Let's start our first question uh, with Matthew. Matthew from Kent. There he is in the middle there. Matthew. Good evening. Good Thanks, evening. Kate. Is there a point that you would stand aside in this campaign, Mr Sunak, given opinion polls are pointing to a, a dominant mistrust win, and also, we're seeing daily declarations from big Tory big guns uh, in her favour. Well, thanks for the question, Matthew. And the quick answer is no. And that's because... Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what? That's, that's because I'm fighting for something I really believe in. And I'm taking my ideas around the country. I'm talking to all of you, our members across the country, about what I think is best for our country at a really difficult time. And I want to have that debate with people because I passionately believe what I'm saying is right. I want to convince as many people of that as possible. And hopefully I can do that with you all tonight. But you talk about big guns. I mean, I've also had, in the MP phase of this, in Parliament, the most number of MPs support me not just in the first round, but in every round since. You talk about big guns coming out. I just had Nigel Lawson this morning, Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor, supporting my approach to the economy. Michael Howard, a former leader of our party, just introduced me at a hustings yesterday. William Haig, another leader of our party, and my predecessor in Richmond and North Yorkshire, are all supporting my candidacy. So, look, I think I've got lots of support, but I'm going to fight incredibly hard till the last day of this campaign for each and every one of your votes. The stakes are really high. I'm passionate about what I believe in, and I want to try and convince you all that I'm right. Anybody else that's going to support Mr Sunak? I'll get a few. You're all very quiet, though. So, you've got a question? Uh, yes, hi. Um, now, I've, been, I've been a Tory for the last 30 years, and I did stand for Parliament in 2005. Now, I've been absolutely disgusted with the uh, level of disunity within the Tory party. So, yes, I'll be supporting you, uh, but once you, if you do become Prime Minister, 
How will you ensure that you unite the Tory party so that we can win the next general election? Yeah, no, I'm so glad you asked her. It's a really important point because I think, I think how we select this audience, we're all on the same team, right? We're all part of the same Conservative family and we are going to need to come back together afterwards. And look, I think you can take some comfort from the fact that not only do I have the most support of MPs in Parliament, that support is drawn from every bit of our parliamentary party, people in the North, MPs in the South, MPs who voted Remain, MPs who voted Leave, experienced colleagues, the likes of which we just talked about in Matthew's question, but brand new MPs as well, MPs in rural areas and urban areas. So that's the breadth of my support, because that's the kind of person I am, that I, I can build a broad team around me. That, and that's what I'm going to do in government. I want to make sure that we have a government that represents all the talents and traditions of our amazing party, and you saw some of that on display in this leadership election early on. I want all of you to be able to look up the government and feel a piece of your view of conservatism represented. Uh, that's how we're going to bring people back together, because we all know in this room the enemy is not me or Liz or anyone else. Our real opposition is Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, and I'm the person who can take the fight to them and win the next election for all of us, because that's what we all want to see, isn't it? Um... <laughs> Actually, that's a similar question to Andrew from West London. Where's Andrew? Andrew? I'm over here. You're over there as well. Andrew, were you happy with that response? Well, sort of, but you know, I, think, I think historically we have to look at the fact that parties that are divided do not win elections. We are two years out, less than two years out from a general election. What specifics can we do, what specifics can you do to reunite the party? Well, well, Andrew, you're, you're right. We are only a couple of years out from a general election, and that's why getting on with the job as quickly as possible is really important. We don't have time to waste. So it starts day one with building that team that I talked about that does bring people back together around the cabinet table and across government. No more factions, no more who supported who in the leadership contest. We have to put all that aside the moment this contest ends and start looking forward and start delivering for the British people. We've got real challenges, and I'm sure we're going to get to talk about the economy in a minute, but that's the number one challenge. We've got to get the NHS backlogs down. We've got to get to grips with illegal migration. We've got to make sure that we provide more energy for us all at home. There's lots of challenges we've got, and we need to get on and do them fast. So if we've got a brand new team, united in purpose, to deliver for the British people and focus on the prize of winning the next election, I think that will galvanise minds. I'm the person that can bring people together okay. and lead us so, to that victory. So, OK. Can I come back Very quickly, again? if you wouldn't mind. So, so, so how many people in the current Cabinet would you have in your Cabinet? OK, go. I, well, well, Andrew, look, I, wouldn't, I don't think you'd expect me to answer that. A, it's premature, as we heard from the first question. I've got a lot of work to do in this campaign and I'm going to fight for every vote and that's what I'm focused on right now. But I will tell you, I will build a team that reflects the talents and traditions of our entire party. Okay, the ones that are still And that's what you will be able to look up at my government okay. and see yourself and everyone else reflected okay. in it. OK, Claire from Solihull. Claire. OK, hi there, hi, Rishi. Hi, are you, Claire? Uh, there so, the, my question is... The, hi, Claire. Hi. Uh, the security of this country worries me greatly with all the sabre-rattling from Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. So, if you become PM, will you commit to increasing the size and budget of our armed forces to make this country once again a force to be reckoned with? Yes, Claire. That the simple answer is absolutely. And I don't want to say once again, because I think we are already a force to be reckoned with. We're an amazing country that projects our values and our influence around the world, supporting our allies. So I don't think we have to think that we're not. We already are, but there's always more we can do. Now, remember, I was the Chancellor who oversaw the largest increase in the defence budget since the end of the Cold War. That's my track record. And actually, I singled out the Ministry of Defence in the middle of the pandemic for a special treatment because they were going through a period where they were looking at future threats. They needed the certainty of knowing that they had the funding to make all those investments in the new technologies that would keep us safe. That's why I gave them the special treatment. That's not that's, what the Prime Minister that, said. He that, said that you had to be... Oh, actually, Ben Wallace said the Prime Minister had to overrule you. Uh, no, that's not right. We actually do all so these ben things Wallace together. So Ben Wallace was wrong. I, I'm not going to talk ill of any of my colleagues, but ultimately I'm the Chancellor that's responsible for the decisions on how we spend our money, and that's what I did, right? But you don't have to take my, my word for it there. When it came to Ukraine, what else did we do? I managed to find £2 billion from across government to send to Ukraine to support them so we can help them and protect our values and stand up to Russian aggression. But what I'm not going to do is stand here and give you an arbitrary target. And I, I know that's what Liz has said in this campaign, and I don't believe in that. 
I don't think that's the right response to defence spending. I don't believe in arbitrary targets. I believe in taking a threat-based approach. I believe in looking at the threats we face and then allocating spending accordingly. So what I can commit to you, Claire, is this. I will tell you, I will invest whatever it takes to keep you and everyone else in our country safe. Because that is the first duty of a Prime Minister, and it's certainly the first duty of a Conservative Prime Quick Minister. follow-up from this lady here. We'll just wait for the microphone, madam, if you would. There we go. Thank you. You were also the Chancellor that introduced Eat Out to Dine Out at, at a cost of £850 million. And according to the University of Warwick, that was responsible for an increase of co new COVID cases of between 8 and 17%. Well, actually, that's one study that said that, and I don't think it's right. And it doesn't explain the fact that in almost any, every other country around Europe, everyone else experienced another wave of COVID, and they didn't all have the same policy. So it's a bit odd to blame that policy for an increase in COVID cases when that happened across Europe and indeed across most of the world. But I tell you what I was thinking at that moment. What I was looking at was a situation where we had hundreds of thousands of largely small hospitality businesses that were on the brink of bankruptcy. Because in this country, everyone was so scared and all the evidence said that no one was gonna go back out again. And in an economy like ours, that would have been disastrous. And you know what's worse? Two million people work in all those small businesses. And those two million people are disproportionately young. They're women, they're working part-time, they're people who are coming off unemployment benefit into okay. work. So as a matter of social justice, I wanted to protect those jobs, okay. those families' livelihoods, that's why I did it. And everywhere I go in this campaign, across the country, okay, I have people on. who come up to me and say thank you for that because okay. it saved our business and it saved those jobs. Tom? <laughs> they like that one, Mr Sunak. Tom from Bury St Edmunds. I'm Tom. right behind you, Kay. There we go. <laughs> I'm always behind everybody. <laughs> uh, that's, Tom, that sounded slightly go. ominous. I'm but... so sorry. <laughs> I'm a town councillor for Bury St Edmunds. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. And we lost our King's Road... NHS dentist. They were brilliant. That was in 2018. Now some of us are going around talking like tube stations. Mind the gap. Mind the gap. What can be done? It's 2022. We need NHS dentistry because, frankly, a lot of us cannot afford to go private. And we have fantastic private dentists in Paris Edwards, but we need our NHS back. What can you do? How soon can you do it? That's the what, problem. What I'm happens, running out of teeth. What happened to your teeth? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to your teeth? I lost them. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, goodness. Yes, you did. We're, getting, we're getting an actual view right yeah, now of the camera yeah. in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it's funny, as I've said, I, you know, I have seven fillings, and, and that's because I drank an enormous amount of Coke when I was a youngster, so I, know, I feel your pain. And we do need good dentistry. Yeah. And look, I, look, the NHS, first of all, is everyone's number one public service yeah. priority. And I grew up in an NHS household. You may have heard on this campaign, my dad was he a GP. He never mentions it. And my mum... <laughs> just checking, you never know, right? You know, and my mum ran uh, a chemist where I grew up. So I spent my time working in that. I understand how important, especially primary care is. But look, you know, if we're going to get to grips with this and make sure that there is money for NHS dentistry, we just have to be bolder about reforming the NHS to get more efficiency out of it. Now, I'm someone who you can absolutely trust with the NHS. I'm someone who did something quite difficult, and that's create a new funding stream to support not just the NHS, but social care, because it does start with putting more resources in to help recover from the pandemic. It was an easy thing for me to do. Lots of people are upset with me about it, but I believed it was the right thing for the country, the right thing to support our fantastic NHS doctors and nurses. But money's not enough. We need to reform things so we can get more efficiency and invest in things like dentistry. I'll give you one example of something that I'm prepared to do, which is a bit bold, it is a bit radical, and not everyone will love it, but I want to show you that I'm going to bring some change, and that's tackling missed appointments. Now, we have over 10 million missed appointments every year, and it's not just GPs, it's in hospitals. At the same time, we've got lots of people sitting there anxiously waiting for treatment. Yeah. And I've said that's not acceptable. So we need to be tougher on missed appointments, because if we are, then if people can cancel them in advance properly, we free up all that extra capacity and none of us have had to pay an extra penny in taxes to do that. How's that workable, though? Thank you. How's and that I think... workable? How's that workable? What about people who can't afford to pay the £10 and they miss the... so they can't pay to afford to pay their fine? Um, do they not get treatment in future? What happens? Well, actually, Kay, as I said, it you don't have to do it on people's first missed. It can be for people who missed a second appointment because there are just so many that there's a lot of space in the system. And I do think it's right to actually say, hang on, 
We believe in an NHS that's free at the point of use, but it's not free at the point of misuse. And when people don't show up for appointments, they are depriving other people of treatment that they need. So there's someone equally vulnerable waiting there, sitting on a waiting list, waiting to see their uh, consultant or their GP, and they're not getting that chance because someone else has just not bothered to show up, and that's not all right. And look, there will be some people like you who say, oh, gosh, maybe we shouldn't do that. But if we're not it's prepared not to be... It's not me saying it. It's the Lancet saying well, well, it. The if Lancet we're not prepared saying it's low socioeconomic backgrounds but that's okay. that miss their appointments for all but, sorts of reasons, and, and, and they and can't And you can be compassionate guys. first time, but at the end of the day, if we all want to cut taxes in this country, if we want to find money to spend more on dentistry, we have to be prepared to do things differently, challenge the system, and that's what I'm prepared to do. Because I want to have great health care, I want to have great dentistry for you and for my future fillings, but I do want to be able to cut your taxes too. We're only going to be able to do that if we're going to reform things and do things differently. That's the kind of Prime Minister I'm going to be. Thank we you. can only be compassionate once. Um, Jeff from Devon. Jeff, where are we, Jeff? Okay. Hey, Jeff. Oh, you're Hello. all over here today. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Right. Is it Jeff, was it? So? Jeff. Yes, Rishi, yes. yes. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, given the problems we've had with borders control and yes. obviously the massive controversy with the Rwanda policy, what's your plan to um, cut illegal channel crossings? Yes, great question and something I've been talking a lot about over the last couple of weeks. Look, you know, I'm, I'm the product of this country's extraordinarily compassionate approach to welcoming immigrants to our shores. My family are beneficiary of that, probably others in the audience, and it's something that we should all feel really proud of. It's something that Britain is amazing at. And even most recently, Ukraine, Hong Kong, Syria, Afghanistan, we've showed our compassion. But it is also absolutely right that we have control over our borders. Because all the people I just mentioned came here legally. And what is not right is for people to break the rules and come here illegally. The scenes we see on our TV screens and small boat crossings are wrong, and they need to stop. And I'm prepared, again, to do some different things, to be bold and radical, to stop them. There's a 10-point plan on my website with a video, so you please go and have a look at that tonight and anyone else that's interested in this topic. I'll give you two examples of things that I'm prepared to do now. One is we need to change the definition of asylum and move away from this European definition, which has become very broad, it's exploited by lefty lawyers and means it's very hard to remove people. I suggest moving to a different definition, another legal standard internationally used by, I think, the Australians and others, and that is a much tighter definition and will allow us to reject more people. So that's one thing we can do. The second thing is we've got to get smarter about our foreign policy. At the moment, we'll happily talk to a country and talk about the trade deal we're going to give them and maybe even the aid that we're going to send that country but we don't then also say, hang on, you have to take back your failed asylum seekers. Well, that's not right. We should be more joined up. We should be tougher about that. So that's just two of the things in my 10-point plan. But fundamentally, we must get a grip of this. We have to make the Rwanda policy work. I will do whatever it takes, including legal changes if required, to make it work so we get control of our borders. Although we're a compassionate country and will always be, it's entirely right, and many of us voted Brexit for this reason, that we are in control of who's coming here. That's a simple thing, and I will deliver it as PM. OK. Applause on that one. Gentlemen, there, really quickly, because we need to move on. If we can just stretch over with the microphone for you, sir. There we go. Your question, really quickly. So, we currently have a points-based immigration system. Do you propose any changes or are you happy to keep it as it is? So, look, on, on immigration, look, for, for we have to tackle this question of illegal... Jeff's question on illegal migration. We shall tackle that robustly and radically, so that's part one. Now, with the rest of immigration, right, there's a couple of things. I, I, I want to be pragmatic about this, so I want to make sure that we're also supporting our economy to grow. Uh, and that means having an immigration system that actually welcomes the best and the brightest from around the world. Because if we want to grow our economy, if we want people here who are going to set up companies of the future, who are going to come and research in our universities, who are going to come and work at some of our fastest growing companies, actually, we want to have a visa regime that makes us the best place in the world for all those people to come. I started reforming the system as Chancellor and as Prime Minister, I want to finish the job so that the best and the brightest, wherever they are around the world, America, India, Brazil, wherever, they think, huh, the UK is the place I want to come. Because if we can attract them here, it's going to be good for all of us, it's going to be good for the economy, and that's something that I want to deliver. OK, we've got a question from Alexander on trust. Alexander, you've got a question hey, for hi, Alexander's just Hi, here. Alexander. Yeah, good to see you, buddy. Uh, what does honesty mean to you in politics and leadership? Great question. So, look, it, it, honesty, in a sense, it means telling you the truth, right? And even when that's not easy. 
And I think you can see in this leadership election, that's what I'm doing, right? And that first question at the beginning of how I'm doing in the polls and all of that, right? I am saying some things that are maybe not the easiest thing in the world to hear. I'm not sitting here or standing here promising you tens and tens of billions of pounds of goodies straight away because I don't think that's the right thing to do for our economy. I think it's risky. I think it risks making the inflation problem far worse and costing you all far more. And you know what? My life would be far easier if I wasn't saying that, right? But I want to be honest with you. I want to be straight with a country about the challenges we face and what is going to be required to fix them. And that's why I think you can trust me on this, because I'm prepared to do that, even though it's going to cost me politically. At two, Mr Sunak, though. At two, Mr Sunak, we, uh, we've seen the images of what you were allegedly... Uh, the the uh, Nadine Doris, I think it was, who came up with this... I don't know, has anybody seen it? Yeah. Stamb stabbing you in the back. I mean, how do you respond to that? Sorry, Kate, what do you... Well, my point is we're talking about trust. You can't be trusted. Uh, what, which bit is are you... what Nadine, Nadine, Nadine Doris... You're you nice in Boris for your own interest. That's, there you go. The right, perfect, right, OK, let's, 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 let's address that. That's actually great that yeah. you've raised it. Sorry, what was your name, sir? Stephen. Stephen, right. So, yes, I worked with the Prime Minister for a couple of years and I'm really proud of the work we achieved together, actually, and I think he deserves enormous credit for what he achieved during that time. And I, as I said, I'm proud to have been a part of it and he great, gave me the job I had and I'm grateful to him for it. But it got to a point where it was too difficult for me to stay. Now, I, we had well-documented doc differences of opinion on economic policy, as you can see in this leadership campaign, by the way, and it's simply impossible for a Chancellor and Prime Minister not to be on the same page when it comes to economic policy. That doesn't make sense, and, and there's no way that can work. So, of course, I had no choice but to go. But also, it came to a point where the government was on the wrong side of an ethical problem that I could not defend. And enough was enough for me. But it wasn't just me, Steve. It was 60 other members of parliament all left the government at the same time, because for them, enough was enough. Okay. And that's why we're here, they didn't because we need to change things. In December last year, did they, Rishi? You, you've been campaigning for a long time, and it was perfectly timed, a cynical motivation to try and get you into number 10. No, so that's, that's just that. sim simply not true. So I was due to give a speech with the Prime Minister the next week, and in the conversations about putting that speech together on the economy, it was clear our differences were too big to reconcile. Okay. So that was the reason. Plus, I think, let's not, we'll not look at the, his, the bass with rose-tinted spectacles here. Everyone remembers what was going on with Chris Pincher, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that, yeah. that was a serious ethical question that the government was on the wrong side of again, and I couldn't defend it. Maybe you're OK to defend that. I wasn't OK to defend it. 60 other members of the government were not OK to defend it because it was wrong. And that's why we're here, because we need to change things. We need to bring trust and integrity and decency and honesty back into politics. Okay. And that's what I want to do as Prime Minister. OK, OK. I'm going to have to brush up on my Shakespearean references, I can tell. <laughs> um, let's bring in David from London, finally. Where are you, David? David's here. Hi, David. Go Thanks. on. Hi, OK. Thank you. David, hi. Good evening, Mr Sinak. Um, how will you balance the need to address the escalating cost of living crisis, particularly for those that are on lower incomes, alongside the need to keep the economy in good order and national debt not spiralling out of control? You know, David, you know, your question is actually the most important one facing the country right now, right? And I'm sure many of you saw what the Bank of England had to say today. And you know, we in the Conservative Party need to get real and fast because the lights on the economy are flashing red and the root cause is inflation. Now, I'm worried that Liz Truss's plans will make the situation worse. And what I want to do is different. I think the government's number one priority should be grappling with inflation. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I also want to help people with the cost of living over the autumn and winter, particularly, as you said, the people who most need our help. And that's what I announced as Chancellor. That's how I acted over the past two years. That's what I'll do as your Prime Minister. That's what a Conservative government should do, support those who need our help most at a time of need. But then also, I want to grow the economy and I want businesses to be producing more and that's how we're going to not just grow the economy and create jobs, it's how we're going to get inflation down over time. I've got a plan to do all of those things, but it all starts with not making the situation worse. Because if we just put fuel on the fire of this inflation spiral, all of us, all of you, are going to just end up with higher mortgage rates, savings and pensions that are eaten away and misery for millions. I don't want that okay. to happen, and that's why I am so focused on gripping inflation first. OK, ladies and gentlemen, Mr Sunak, have a seat. All oh, right. Thank you.
Need any water? Yes, why not? Right. Excellent. Right, my turn. Here we go. Let's uh, talk about the economy to start with, should we? Today, as uh, was being pointed out, the Bank yeah. of England uh, saying that we're going to be in recession before the end of the year, and that's going to last until 2024. Uh, people watching at home, and I'm guessing some people here as well, facing months and months of hardship. You've been their Chancellor for the last two years. Why on earth should they trust you with the keys of number 10? In fact, because they've seen me as Chancellor over the last couple of years, and I think actually, Kay, probably the first time people really saw me was that first press conference when there was an enormous amount of anxiety in the country about what was going to happen to people's jobs, their livelihoods, their businesses, and they didn't really know who I was. I'd just been a made Chancellor a couple of weeks before. But I stepped up at that moment to act boldly and radically to design things that had never been done before in this country like furlough, that ended up protecting over 10 million jobs, saved over a million businesses, helped families get through what are two very difficult years, and for our economy to emerge at the end of that in far more resilient shape than anyone had anticipated at the beginning. And when I go around the country, people know that that's what I did for them. They're grateful for it. And that's what I want to do as Prime Minister, because right now we face similarly large economic challenges. And Nothing it's particularly because of my though, experience that I'm well placed to deal with Nothing them. Nothing you can do about recession, though, is there? Or is there? Of course there is. Of course there Tell is. Back us. to David, David's question. The, the number one thing we have to do is not make the situation worse. What is causing the recession? Right? As you heard from the Bank of England today, and I think Liz said something before, which I am just going to correct. It's not the tax burden that is causing the recession. That's simply wrong. What's causing the recession is inflation. Right? That's the root of the problems we have, not just here, but in America and elsewhere. So the way we're going to get through this, first and foremost, is gripping inflation. Now, we will, and I always have stood by people, as you've seen me over the last couple of years, so I will help people get through the autumn and the winter, as I've done before, and then we will make the right reforms to help grow the economy in the long term. And I, I don't think the corporate so tax proposals... So you would come up with more money to help people get Of course I would. Do you know how much? Well, we'll have to see the size of the problem. But, look, people can see 13.3% me... inflation is what's predicted. That, yeah. That, that, yeah. That's and, the size of the problem. And, and, and I don't want that to be worse. And I don't want it to last longer. So what I'm not going to do is embark on a borrowing spree worth tens of billions of pounds, put that on the country's credit card, ask our kids and our grandkids to pick up the tab, because that's not right, it's not responsible, and it's certainly not Conservative. But you're promising tax cuts without knowing where inflation will be. But I, I, I'm the one that's not standing or you know, sitting here now uh, promising tens of billions of pounds of unfunded what tax amount, cuts. Uh, what you've right. actually said is no tax cuts until inflation gets under control. What amounts to under control? When it's on a clearly downward trajectory and we're, we have good line of sight that it is returning back to target, right? OK. Right. But, um, that does, but th that's why we need to be really careful about policies that will make that worse. Right. And look, I, you know, I, if, if that's to the first question, uh, it, you know, I'm behind in this race. And... No, I'm just a bit confused. I, so you're saying these income tax cuts might not happen? It depends. You're talking about my longer term plan? Yes, of course I am. Yeah, my, my longer term plan, I'm confident we can deliver it. Yes. Right. And that was the reason I published that longer term plan. And that longer term plan for those watching was to over time reduce income tax rates in this country, because I believe really strongly in rewarding hard work. Hard work is a value that I think is really important. I think most Conservatives share that view, that hard work is something that should be rewarded. The the best way to do that through the tax system is to reduce the rate of income tax. And I wanted to give people a sense of the direction of where I wanted to take the country and the economy. And I want to build an economy where we cut the rates of income tax over time. And we're going to do that not by okay. asking our kids to pick okay. up the bill. We're going to do it by being okay. disciplined on public spending, Economics reforming public services and growing the economy. Economics is where you're very comfortable and, and we know exactly what you think. What we don't probably know about is foreign affairs as much. Um, so let me ask you about energy and food bills and how that relates to foreign affairs, potentially. Um, how high do you think that energy and food bills will have to go before we reassess our support for Ukraine? No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's how we're going to look at it, actually, because we can make an enormous difference over between now and actually next winter in reducing our dependence on Russian energy. So in the short term, of course, we're going to step in and I want to step in and help people more. I announced enormous support as Chancellor. As Prime Minister, I'll go further because the situation has deteriorated. But what I'm looking to is by next winter that we've got through this. 
And there's lots of things we can do to help us do that. So, so I'll give a couple of examples, so, right? So, so one thing we can do is improve our energy storage because actually we can import lots of gas in the middle of the that year. That takes from time, places. though, doesn't it? No, no, we actually, we can do that relatively quickly, improved energy storage during the middle of the year. But the other thing we can do is energy efficiency. Now, many of you here, many people watching, are living in homes where we can help improve the insulation. Loft insulation, cavity wall insulation, smart temperature controls. Those are relatively small-scale interventions that don't take very long or cost a fortune, and government has got money. But if we turbocharge that programme, we can not only reduce our demand for energy, which improves our energy security, we can also save people up to £300 on their bills. Now, that's the type of thing that we should so be doing. So, if we continue to uh, support Ukraine as long as we lag, lag our loft, is that what you're saying? Uh, we need to be lagging our loft anyway for climate change reasons, right? Because it's good to reduce our long-term we'll demand on, on energy, change. right? But uh, what we do want to do we'll is make sure we help change. people with their bills. And okay. that's a good practical on the conflict, example of something we can do. On the conflict in Ukraine, Boris Johnson has um, really thrown himself into the cause. I think everybody might agree with that. He's regarded as a hero, apparently, in Ukraine. That's what he tells us. He brandishes his missile launchers. We've seen that. Are you really tough enough to stand up to Vladimir Putin? Well, let, just think for a moment. How, how are we currently standing up? This is up? your hell yeah, yeah moment. Yeah, so how are we standing <laughs> up to Vladimir Putin? Right? How are we actually doing it? We're doing two things. Right? We're sending arms and money to Ukraine, which, as we talked about earlier, I found from elsewhere in government spending so that we could free up that money to send to President Zelensky. But what's the other way we're weakening Russia? We're doing it through economic sanctions. Right? We're not sending our troops into Russia. Right? It's not diplomatic measures that are making a difference, it's economic. What are we doing? We're targeting his companies, their access to global capital markets, his gold trading, his central bank reserves. That's how we're economically turning the screw on Russia. Who do you think put all those things together? I did with all my finance minister colleagues around the world, working with the Treasury Secretary in America, working with European finance ministers. We designed an international package of economic sanctions that sends a very strong message that we will not stand for his aggression. It's the most stringent set of economic sanctions the world has ever seen, and it is making a difference. And as Prime Minister, I will go further, because there's more things we can do. So, yes, I'm tough enough, and I'm already delivering the measures that are actually causing him the most trouble. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, ben Wallace, um, as we, I, I mentioned before, said that uh, you had to be overruled on defence spending. Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, reportedly said that you objected to the Rwanda plan during a written discussion between the departments. Brandon Lewis, the Northern Ireland Secretary, former Northern Ireland Secretary, has accused you of putting up huge resistance on uh, efforts to override the Northern Ireland Protocol. It looks as though there's a recurring theme there, doesn't there? You say one thing in private and then you say something else for voter consumption. So should we believe them? Or should we believe you? Well, look, when it comes to the Rwanda plan, I, I do believe in the Rwanda policy, but yeah, do I ask tough questions when cabinet ministers come to me and say, oh, look, we like to do this new thing? Yeah, because my job is to make sure that yours and everyone else watching and everyone in this audience's money is spent properly. That's part of my job. I wouldn't be doing my job properly if every time some cabinet minister came to me and said, oh, please, can I have X billion pounds to do this new thing? I don't say, well, hang on, let me just check that this actually is going to work. Is it worth us spending so taxpayers' money on it? So you think spending £120 so, million pounds, um, on sending 200 people to Rwanda is good value for money? Yeah, well, it's a pilot, right? So the pilot bit is expensive. So you're asking now exactly the questions I was asking. So if Priti Patel or anyone else is going to say, oh, now I expressed some doubts about it, it was doubts about how we're going to make the policy work. I believe in the policy, but it's not good enough in government to just announce things. Okay. It's not good enough to put out a press release. It's, what you need to do is deliver things. And I think what people saw from me during the pandemic as Chancellor that I could deliver things. I actually delivered policies that worked and made a difference, which, by the way, were done in record time and were radical. And I will bring that same sense of grip and urgency okay. and competence to all these other challenges, whether it's the Rwanda policy, whether it's the NHS backlogs. OK, let's talk about climate. You brought it up. Uh, we're trying to whiz through these topics as best we can, uh, because obviously some of these people have not got their ballot papers yet, some have, and what you're telling them, both here in the studio and at home this evening, could uh, make the difference as to whether or not you are the next Prime Minister of this country. So let's talk about the climate, should we? One issue that affects not just our finances, but of course our future, is um, your green credentials. Can I test them? Uh, sure. <laughs> here we go. New coal mines, yes or no? Uh, that's, they're local decisions, but I don't think we should be uh, importing coal from other places if we have it at home. 
OK. What about fracking? Uh, where, where it has the support of local communities, I'm in favour of it. OK, but we have seen some big issues with fracking, haven't we? Particularly in my part of the world, in the northwest of England, uh, where we've seen at least three earthquakes that apparently uh, have been caused by fracking. Yeah, but we also, as I said, most importantly, it has to be done with the support of local communities. But we do also have a study from, I think, uh, I think three different royal societies. I think of geologists and engineers and, and I can't remember the third group, but it's online somewhere, all of whom said that they believe fracking is safe and the seismic activity is not out of the ordinary. They're all the scientists who have came to that conclusion, not me. But as I said, I'm supportive of it, where we can bring the local community along with us, because if we can okay. get it to work, it's good for our long-term energy security. Would you security. raise flight taxes? Would I raise...? Flight taxes? No. Why not? Well, well, I, for, because as Chancellor, I already made a change to airline taxation. You did. Not and very I did green, two, though, was it? Uh, uh, yes, it was, actually, because I why. did two things. One is I, I reversed a, a European rule that forced us to charge people twice when they flew inside of the United Kingdom on air, air, air passenger duty. I didn't think that was right. And after we left the EU, we could say, we're not going to do that anymore. If you fly around the UK, because we believe in a United Kingdom, okay. you should only be taxed once. But at the same time, I created a new band for the, the longest haul flights, the most polluting flights. We created a brand new band with a higher level of tax. So actually, it was balanced, right? So for okay. the people who are flying the farthest with the more emissions, they were going to pay more. For people flying within the United Kingdom, you... we, we took an advantage of Brexit. Okay. Let and me cut ask taxes you about there. onshore wind, yes or no, because I'm a bit confused on this one. On, offshore wind, onshore wind, forgive me, yes or no? No. OK, you've changed your mind. No, I haven't. I just last night I was asked a question, I didn't fully understand it and I misspoke, but my position on that is the same as it's been. OK, how are we going to get to net zero by 2050? With innovation. Yeah. Right? And the type of future economy that I want to create is one where this, and we talked about it in the answer to the, the visas question from someone. Okay. Uh, if, if we have an economy where this is the best place in the world for people to create, invent, discover new things, we will get there. Okay. And we will get there in a way that lowers people's bills. Okay. Now, look, my business background, my experience, means I know how to build that type of economy in this We've country. We've got to rush through this. Okay. It's like well, running through a important okay. on net zero. Yep. But quick fire. there's quick, an enormous quick opportunity Quick fire questions there. here, if Fine. you don't mind. Quick fire questions. Here we go. Do you personally support the 24-week limit on abortion? Uh, as a personal thing, yes. I mean, these, these, are, these are personal decisions. They're not government decisions. I don't think there's any need to change the... the I, I believe in a woman's right to choose. I don't think there's any reason to change the laws that we have. Why have you abstained on every major vote on abortion? Uh, probably because I've not been in Parliament on the day. You didn't think it was important enough to be there? <laughs> uh, because as Chancellor, I'm often travelling. <laughs> mm. 2015, apparently. Were you Chancellor in 2015? Uh, no, but, I mean, I, th these, are, these are not free... I mean, I completely agree with our current system of abortion. I don't think it should be changed. Okay. So if the vote, I mean, so that's my general view. That's always been my okay, view. You just, haven't been, you just haven't been there when the votes have been taking place. Would you fist bump uh, the Saudi leader, Mohammed bin Salman, as Joe Biden did? <laughs> I'm, I'm probably not a fist bumping type of person, I think, okay, probably. Would you, shake, <laughs> would you shake his hand then? I mean, I, 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 yes, I, I would shake his hand. I think I generally, I think you do have to engage with people around the world. I, I don't think, and, we, and they're a country that we have a relationship with. Uh, in a video, here it comes, from 2001. You said you didn't have any working class friends. Have you made any working class friends since you left university? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I think I was a student when I said that. We all say silly things when, when we're younger. I mean, at the same time, I was, as, as you know, I was working in my mum's shop. I was out and about cycling around, running around, delivering medicines to people, I, or people from all walks of life. But, you know, obviously I was a kid and I said something silly. So you do have working class friends now? Yeah, I mean, I don't go around asking them what they're, 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 how they define <laughs> themselves. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd rather think we've kind of moved... I think we've moved beyond that as a country, actually. How I think, reassuring. Yeah, yeah. I think people um, are less interested in where you've come from, people are interested in where you're going, and uh, that's the kind of country I want to build, right? Where... Thank you, yeah. Right. Let me ask you the same question that I asked Liz Trust about being Prime Minister being the most invasive, exposed period in any politician's life. Anything you want to tell us about? No. I mean, look, I've had, I've had a relatively high-profile job for two years, and... I think people have seen me in action and uh, they've seen, A, what I can do, they've seen... And look, much of my personal life has also been talked about earlier this year and that was an experience that I took, uh, you know, that I learnt from and, and dealt with. So, yes, I'm, you know, I'm used to the scrutiny. Okay. Another simple question. Have you ever benefited financially from the use of tax havens? No. A venture capital firm you co-founded, Tellman Partners, was registered in the Cayman Islands. 
Um, so just to clarify, I, I personally did you have benefit absolutely never ever benefited and have paid absolutely full normal taxes wherever I've lived. Did you set up that business? No. Okay. So you you weren't a co-founder in two thousand uh, and not of the the bit in the Cayman Islands that you're referring to. I have nothing to do with. Okay. I mean, I happen to work with a company that has multiple offices all around the all around the world, but that's not the, my responsibility. It was not running the company. So or you setting weren't that in up. any way paid by that offshore nope. company. No Absolutely connections not. with no. it. When I was living in America, whatsoever. I paid all my taxes in America, and when I've lived in the UK, I've paid all my taxes in the UK, as okay. completely as anyone else would. Okay. The reason I'm asking is that. As you know, as all our audience know, you've had to clarify your wife's non-DOM status. You held permanent residency in the United States while you were setting the taxes of British voters, which is what a green card means. Um, you're um, building a swimming pool at your constituency home while the public pool in Richmond is facing closure after a 400% energy hike. This has all led to a perception problem for you. People feel that you can't walk a mile in their shoes because you're walking in your Prada shoes. What would you say to them? <laughs> yeah, so, look, uh, you know, over the past couple of weeks, right, I've been out and about across the country talking, talking to members, talking to members of the public, and, as I was saying, lots of people have, have come to talk to me about that press conference and furlough and what difference it made to their lives. Do you know, I, I was wearing the same suit in that press conference, the same shoes as that I'm wearing now. Right, I'm the how same much, person. How much were they worth? Yeah, I, I'm, they're very I'm exactly, slick. I'm exactly the same person. Right, I'm the same person that stood there and made sure that we help the country through a very difficult time, and that's what I'll do as prime minister. And I think the British people judge people by their character and by their actions, not by their bank account. <laughs> Thank you. That certainly seems to be the case as far as the audience is concerned here. But there's plenty of people who are watching at home who would disagree with that. Perception is reality and they think that you're too rich to be Prime Minister. Yeah, well, the, the reality is one of the last things I did as Chancellor was announce significant help for people with their energy bills this autumn and winter. And to the question we had at the front, it, from David, I think it was, right? It, you know, that was... You know, David's question was about helping the most vulnerable, right? People who really needed help. That's what I did. Because, look, we're all going to have a difficult time and, and inflation makes everyone poorer and that's why I'm so concerned about policies that will make it worse and last longer and that's not right. But when we do need to help people this autumn and winter, our focus should be on the people who most need our help. And actually, you know, when Liz is sitting here saying she's going to scrap the NHS levy, do you know who that benefits? That benefits the top 15% of earners. Right? That's what that policy does. It's not going to help the people that David was asking about with the cost of living this winter. Right? The policies I announced as Chancellor are targeted on those people because they are the people that need our help. Right? It's going to be really tough. It's going to be really tough for lots of people. And much as I okay. want to support them to work We're hard and do those things, right? it's going to be just impossible but for some people. And we need to help them, you and that's what I did. You can't do all of that on your own. Um, Penny Mordaunt uh, has backed uh, Ms Truss. Ben Wallace has backed Ms Truss. Nadim Zahawi has backed Ms Truss. Tom Tugendhat has backed uh, Liz Truss. Sajid Javid, your old boss, has backed Ms Truss. Why are so many people supporting her rather than you? Right, but, but Kay, it goes back to the question right at the beginning. Every stage of the parliamentary process I had the broadest yeah, and biggest these number are the of support. people that work most closely with you, uh, but, and they've decided that they prefer her. No, well, hang on. The most MPs in Parliament and all MPs work together in lots of different guises. These people at work around the cabinet table every, with you day in day out, and well, they said, "You know well, what?" We'll actually, Tom Tugendhat and Penny Morden are not in the cabinet. Okay. Actually. Um, but uh, every single round of the parliamentary process. Was it being at your cabinet? I led. Right? I was the person that MPs cabinet? chose every round ahead of everyone else. And since it finished, more and more people have come and joined the team. So I'm actually, I'm really humbled by that and I'm delighted. And actually, as, as we were answering a question, that support is drawn really widely from across the parliamentary party. And, and, and I'm not going to get into who's going to have this job and that job. I've got a contest that I want to try and win. I want to be out and about talking to all of you about my ideas for the future. But I will build a team that reflects all the talent and traditions of our party, as I said. You saw a lot of that on display in this leadership contest. And as we talk talked about before, we're all one team. We're all one family. We're going to come together after this. We're going to serve the British people and then we're going to take it to Keir Starmer and win the next election because that's the real prize. Final thought. When you, go, you know, when you look at yourself in the mirror at night just before you go to bed and you think, all these people that have sat around the cabinet table with me and now they don't want to work with me, they think that the other candidate's better. Uh, but plenty of people sat around the cabinet table also support me. Right, Dominic Robb, the Deputy Prime Minister, 
is out there right now talking about it and lots of others. But I also, as I said, now Actually, answer to the question. Him. Actually, right? just him. Right. But I, think, I think we only just have one person. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, much as we love you and we love Sky, I think yeah. there's really a tolerate just one person giving up their evening to come and talk to you later. But, uh, I, you know, I've been, you know, I've been really Not humble. Not sure actually. how to take that, actually. Well, I know, I'm, you know what? <laughs> I, I think, I I think, think that's people... a perfect place to end. It's <laughs> lovely to see you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very, much. very nice to see you. Thank Thanks you. very much. Stay with us one second if you want to stay with us. Thank you. So. So our candidates have had their chance to make their case, but what do the people who will decide their future make of it? We have a simple question for our audience. Are you ready, audience? We rehearsed this beforehand. After what you have heard tonight, who are you most likely to vote for? As you know, you need to press 1 and then send if it's Rishi Sunak, and you need to press 2 and then send if it is Liz Truss. Are we all ready? Any more questions before we need to do that? Everybody knows exactly what they're going to say and do. Away you go. There we go. So, we have 15 seconds when people were pressing one for Rishi Sunak or two for Liz Truss and then pressing, pressing send. And then, as if by magic, in just a few moments' time, we'll find out what our audience here in the studio thinks about who should be the next Prime Minister of this country. Worth just pointing out at this stage that 0.3% of the electorate will decide our next Prime Minister, which means 99.7% of the electorate will not be doing that. Do you think that's fair? Yes. 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 Why do you think it's fair? Gentlemen here, why do you think it's fair? My ballot paper doesn't say who's the next Prime Minister. We have a parliamentary system People voted for the Conservative Party. Yeah. And as members, we're electing the leader. It happens to be that that leader becomes Prime okay. Minister. This is a basic okay, understanding there, of our really system. Quickly. Thank you, gentlemen up here, really quickly with a check shirt. Yep. yep, it's exactly the same as what Labour do okay. when they chose... Um... OK, now, as with all things with live television, the technology has crashed. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do instead is go with a show, a show of hands instead. Are we happy with that? Yeah. So will you, will you allow me to say who I think has probably got more hands? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So if you think that Rishi Sunak had a better show and as a result uh, would potentially make the better prime minister of this country, can you put your hand up now, ladies and gentlemen, please? Oh, my goodness. That looks to me like an awful lot for Mr Sunak. Who would prefer Ms Truss as the next Prime Minister? Now, I, I wasn't expecting that, I have to say, but I think, with just keeping your hands up for Ms Truss while we get some more shots, just to show people at home, it looks to me as though Mr Sunak convinced you far more than uh, Ms Truss. Um, and I'm sorry, sir, we're almost out of time and I have had you let, let you have a oh, couple right. of goals. I th think the only thing that he probably le needs to learn from tonight is to read a bit of Shakespeare. I don't know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's been fantastic to see you all. Thank you so much for taking the time for joining us. Thank you also to Ms Truss and also uh, to Mr Sunak. They were amazing. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. <laughs> really, really appreciate it. Very, very enlightening conversation and discussion from both of them. Coming up in just a few moments' time, Jane Secker will be talking to both uh, Mr Kwarteng and also Mr Raab. And I will see you very soon. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>